Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts, Hemostasis Part 1. A lot of students find hemostasis to be complicated and a little bit confusing, so I've broken it down into two videos. This video will focus from initial endothelial injury to formation of a stable clot. Therefore, our objectives will be to describe the four phases of hemostasis, to compare and contrast the clotting factors and their role in coagulation, and to discuss the multiple roles of thrombin in hemostasis. As usual, I will begin by giving you a little bit of background, and then we will turn to one of the fantastic illustrations in Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology done by Dr. Abhijit Das. These are what I consider to be the four phases of hemo hemostasis. We begin with arteriolar vasoconstriction, which is a neurogenic reflex and also stimulated by local factors. It is a very transient response. Next comes primary hemostasis, which is formation of the platelet plug. In this instance, von Willebrand's factor and collagen are exposed, leading to platelet adherence and activation and formation of that primary hemostatic plug. However, this is not particularly stable or strong, and with the force of blood flow could be simply washed away. So we need to go on to secondary hemostasis in order to really prevent uh, bleeding. In this instance, tissue factor is going to bind and activate factor 7. And then we go through the coagulation cascade, which I will go through, uh, leading finally to thrombin formation, which will cause fibrinogen cleavage and yield fibrin, which is going to help solidify this clot. During this phase, we also have additional platelet aggregation as the, uh, as the signals uh, amplify each other and we end up with thrombus consolidation. And finally, we have clot stabilization in which the fibrin is cross-linked by factor 13 and platelets contract to yield a permanent plug. Now keep in mind, this is not just a permanent plug. What happens next is resolution. And in fact, when the coagulation cascade is initiated, you then have immediate initiation of the fibrinolytic cascade because the body needs to maintain a balance between these two or else disaster will ensue. All right, let's take a look at this fantastic drawing, which goes through the four phases. Now, I've made a small change to the drawing here. These uh, purple bars are von Willebrand's factor, uh, because this is an a, a image we'll see uh, in a couple more slides. So let's begin here. So we have an area of injury where the endothelium is scraped off, perhaps uh, an IV uh, catheter was, uh, was put into the vein, scraping off the endothelium. And what will happen then is you'll have a reflex vasoconstriction through neurogenic mechanisms, but you'll also have endothelin release, uh, which is going to cause vasoconstriction. But this is just very transient. So next what is going to happen is we're going to have this uh, response where platelets are going to adhere to the subendothelial von Willebrand's factor. This is going to, when the, when the platelets are activated, they are going to undergo a shape change, and they go from being flat and disc-like to looking somewhat like sea urchins, very spiky with a lot of surface area. And the surface area is important for propagation of this clot. The activated platelets are then going to release uh, their granules, so from these are going to come adenosine diphosphate and thromboxane A2, which are going to stimulate further recruitment and aggregation of this hemostatic plug. Moving swiftly along now, we're going to have this exposure where tissue factor and the phospholipid complex expression on the platelets is going to form the initiation for the coagulation cascade in which we end up with activation of thrombin. With this, we will get fibrin polymerization, which is going to stabilize this, uh, this clot. But even here, it's not entirely stable, so we need to move further. And one of the things that thrombin does is it activates factor 13, which is then going to uh, allow cross-linking of fibrin. And the, uh, the entire clot here is going to consolidate as the platelets contract. You'll have a variety of uh, cells that are in the blood that are trapped here, like uh, red cells or neutrophils. And you can see these uh, histologically. Now let's take a minute to talk about clotting factors. So when you think about them, most of them, uh, as well as inhibitors, are made in the liver. And this is an important consideration when you have a patient who's in liver failure because they may have a bleeding diathesis. Now we'll talk about the vitamin K dependent factors because this is something that comes up again and again and is important for you to know because we have a therapeutic intervention, namely warfarin, in which we address uh, vitamin K. So the vitamin K-dependent factors are 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as protein C and S. As you, should need, you should know these. There are also two cofactors I'd like to uh, describe. One is cofactor 8, which is absolutely essential. 
It circulates in the plasma bound to von Willebrand's factor, and this binding to von Willebrand's factor prolongs the half-life of factor VIII significantly from about two and a half hours to 12 hours. And I mention this because later in your pathology education, you're going to learn about some of these clotting disorders, such as von Willebrand's disease, hemophilia A, which re uh, relate to these two, uh, these two entities here. So cofactor 8 is going to form a complex with uh, factor 9A to activate uh, factor 10, which is central uh, to the, uh, the entire process. Cofactor 5 is another one which you need to know, and it's found in platelet granules and in plasma. And it forms a complex with 10A to activate prothrombin, moving us to thrombin. And as you'll see, getting to thrombin is what the whole goal is for us. Now, before we go into the coagulation cascade, I want to talk about the two tests that we use to assess clotting. Uh, these are the ones we use more than any others. Uh, the activated partial thromboplastin time, or APTT, is significant because that's the one we use to monitor heparin therapy, and it assesses the intrinsic and common pathway, which we'll go through in just a moment. Prothrombin time, by contrast, measures factors 7, 9, 5, 2, and 1, and is used to monitor warfarin therapy, generally in terms of the international normalized ratio, which we use so that we can compare prothrombin time between laboratories. And this test will measure the extrinsic and common pathway. So I'm going to show you one more image before we go into what exactly the extrinsic, intrinsic, and common pathways are. Now this is a bit of a jump ahead. Uh, in Robbins uh, and Kumar Basic Pathology, uh, we talk about von Willebrand disease uh, in the hematopathology uh, chapter. But I wanted to bring in this image uh, from later in the text because I think it's really useful uh, to have an image of what's happening. So here again is our subendothelial von Willebrand's factor, which also is uh, found in, in the blood. And it associates with factor VIII, as we described before, von Willebrand's factor stabilizing uh, factor VIII. Now factor VIII can also uh, attached to the surface of these platelets. And once it's there, it provides an excellent nidus for this transition of factor 10 to factor 10A, so activation. This is part of the clotting cascade. And this is why when we uh, do clotting studies in, in vitro, we have to add a variety of different things like phospholipids and calcium uh, to, in order to mimic what there is in the blood because it's not uh, a simple process. Now, I want to uh, highlight a couple of things here. So we have fibrinogen, which is going to be helping to uh, helping these platelets to aggregate and stick together. And then we have a couple of, uh, of proteins on the platelet surface. One is GP1B, which is going to bind to von Willebrand's factor. The other is GP2B3A, which is going to bind here to fibrinogen. And the importance of just recognizing this is that defects in any of these in the GP2B3A, GP1B, or von Willebrand's factor is going to lead to a bleeding diathesis. And you'll learn more about those in the hematopathology section. All right, so now let's talk about clotting in vivo. I think that that previous image helped a little bit as far as clarifying things, but here's what happens. We have scraping off of our endothelium with exposure of tissue factor, which is going to take us from factor seven to factor seven A, so it will be activated here. Whenever you see the little A, it means it's an activated factor. So nine is going to go from uh, nine to nine A through the use of tissue factor and factor seven A. Factor 8A is going to come in with factor 9A and is going to help you get from factor 10 to activated factor 10, which is going to bring in our factor 5. And this is what we want to get to is thrombin, because what thrombin will do for us is it's going to break down fibrinogen into fibrin, which will allow us to form that fibrin clot and stabilize. Now, thrombin has a lot of different activities, and we'll talk about them a little later in this video. For one thing, it activates uh, cofactor 5, it activates cofactor uh, 8A, and it also activates uh, factor 11. So thrombin is very important. Okay, now let's take a step back and talk about what we look at in the laboratory, because as I mentioned, it's different. So what we can look at is two different pathways, the intrinsic pathway seen here on the left, the extrinsic pathway on the right, they both unite here in what's called the common pathway. And I'm going to show you a schematic in the next slide, because I think this slide is a little bit busy. So in order to measure the intrinsic pathway, we're going to uh, add some negatively charged, uh, some sort of negatively charged surface like glass beads. And we're going to measure the amount of time it takes us to get to the fibrin clot. 
To assess the extrinsic pathway, we're going to add tissue factor, which is going to take us down to help us assess uh, how our factor 7 uh, is, is doing to take us to the uh, activation of factor 10. So let's go to a schematic of this, right? Now I just want to tell you that I personally don't think it's important to memorize all of the intricacies of the different names of these factors because in addition to numbers they all have uh, additional names. Uh, it depends pretty much on, on your uh, curriculum what your instructors want you to know and I just want you to know there are some amazing videos out there uh, that have uh, mnemonics for uh, learning the different parts of these pathways. Uh, so this one just shows it very schematically. The intrinsic pathway, remember we're adding our glass beads here, is going to have 12, 11, 9, and 8 coming to 10, and then the common pathway, which is going to have cofactor 5, take us to prothrombin, which is factor 2, and then we get to fibrinogen. The extrinsic, factor, uh, extrinsic pathway by comparison is going to involve tissue factor and factor 7. And this is the important thing to remember, intrinsic pathway, APTT, and uh, extrinsic pathway is going to be PT. All right, now all of this, as I've mentioned, is about getting to thrombin. So why is thrombin so fabulous? So thrombin does a lot. It's not just a single uh, monofunctional protein. The first thing that we always think about is it's going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin, which is going to stabilize your clot. As I've already mentioned, it will activate factor 13, which is necessary for covalently cross-linking fibrin. It activates factors 5 and 8, as well as factor 11. But it has a couple of other factors we haven't addressed yet. And one is the, uh, it stimulates the activation and aggregation of platelets by activating protease-activated receptors, or PARs. These PARs also play a role in mediating tissue repair and angiogenesis and are pro-inflammatory. Now, there are some anticoagulant effects that thrombin has, but we'll talk about that in part two hemostasis. So let's look at a figure uh, that will just put all of that information into one graphic for you. Okay, here we have thrombin, uh, which is going to activate, uh, it's going to cleave fibrinogen and take us to fibrin. Fibrin is going to come down here and form a mesh network in here with platelets. We also have thrombin activating factor 13, and this is going to allow the actual uh, cross-linking, so to really stabilize the clot, you need thrombin. And as I mentioned, thrombin plays a role in platelet aggregation and degranulation. Now when platelets degranulate, they're going to release thromboxane A2, and they can also release platelet-derived growth factor, and it's thought that the role of that is going to affect the smooth muscle cells in the healing of this injury, so as part of the, the healing response. Now thrombin has uh, another series of roles, as we mentioned, it's pro-inflammatory, so it will bind to your protease-activated receptor. We have this little red half a donut, which we see here on this lymphocyte, on this monocyte, and here even on this platelet. So thrombin will bind here and activate this lymphocyte uh, and this monocyte, and then it can also activate the endothelium, and this is going to increase neutrophil adhesion. All right, so that's it, all of it together in one picture. Okay, so here are just some questions for you to ask yourselves in, just to see how much you learned from this short video. What are the four phases of hemostasis? And this is more for the clinical aspect. What do APTT and PT measure and which therapy uh, is each used to monitor? And what are the different roles of thrombin in hemostasis? All right, thank you very much. Please put comments below. I really look forward uh, to reading your feedback. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, send me an email or check out the website. And as always, have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you very much.